So Lydia, Michael. <laughs> Applause. It, we are expecting a full house, so if everybody um, has like sitting together and there's one seat in the middle, if you could move over, that would be great. I think there'll be some stragglers. Welcome to our in-person and virtual audience. My name's Amy McDonald. I'm the director of City Space. Two and a half years ago, we had Michael Schur on this stage, along with the actor William Jackson Harper. And he was here to talk about the show. He had recre created The Good Place. How many uh, are fans here? <laughs> How many are still watching it? How many have just recently discovered it? Dad. Dad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, fast forward today, and Michael has written a book. How to be perfect, the correct answer to every moral question. Joining him again to moderate the conversation is our moral philosopher, Lydia Moland, who will ask my questions about his book and challenge us with philosophical conundrums. If you have one of your own, please go to slido.com and type in hashtag sure and we will try and get to as many of your questions and philosophical questions as you have. Following the conversation, thank you, Mike, for agreeing to stay and sign copies of the book. Our wonderful independent bookstore, Brookline Booksmith, is selling them. With no further ado, Michael and Lydia. Thank you, Amy. Did she say slido.com? Uh, yeah, sly.do, yes. Sly dot dough? Sly dot. Oh, that's easy. That, this is going to work great. <laughs> yeah, no, no, nothing can go wrong from this point. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, it's wonderful to be on this stage. It's wonderful to be here in person. This is something that we'll never take for granted uh, again. When we saw each other two and a half years ago, nobody knew what sort of two years we were up for. Um, so it just means that much more to be able to be here in person, but it also means that we have a virtual audience. Um, so hello to everyone who's watching virtually as well. Thanks for joining us, and thank you to Amy and her wonderful crew for making this night um, possible. Um, I, for those who weren't with us last time, I feel like I should just spend a minute explaining to you why I, of all people, have the privilege of being on this stage uh, with Mike. So. As a young adult, my goal in life was to be an NPR reporter. So I moved to Boston. I started working at WBUR right away. Um, and then, I, I, so I worked here pretty much through most of undergraduate and a little bit under into graduate school. But journalism just didn't have enough like stomach churning anxiety for me. So I decided it might to have, do, might have paid a little too well. Exactly, also. and it paid too well. So I figured I would do the next logical thing, which was get a PhD in ethics and moral philosophy, which I then did just a couple of blocks down the street here, um, also at BU. Um, so part of what is just amazing to me here to be uh, to be here with Mike is to think about that journey, um, and also to think about the fact that what I've done in the couple of decades since then is really fine-tune my ability to torture students with moral dilemmas mm -hmm. in ways that I think would make any demon in the bad place proud. So, um, and some of those students are watching here tonight uh, virtually, so hello to my students at Colby, and we'll just see if we can torture a few more people. Great. Yeah, just what you always wanted. Um, and I also just wanted to say, so I also teach a course on the philosophy of humor, and I now teach uh, the good place regularly in that course as its kind of own unit. Um, and so it turns out that Mike and I have this kind of bizarre matchup of interests that made for a lot of fun um, in our conversation last time. So when we saw that you'd written a book, we thought we should have you back. And so I sent you this invitation. Unbeknownst to you, that invitation was also a test because the last time you were up here, uh, you promised to come back. And so when... <laughs> so I, I passed. So. You passed, okay. exactly. Great. That's right. So uh, test number one. We're, so as a good Kantian, then, you <laughs> uh, kept your promises, and you're here tonight. And so we're happy. Kant is happy. And everything is fine. Great. So welcome, uh, Mike, uh, to be, for being here tonight. Um, 
So the last time, I just wanted to say too, as Amy mentioned, the last time we were here, we also had William Jackson Harper on stage with us. And um, he, so he plays Cheaty on In the Good Place, or that's how some people describe him. I describe him as the person who plays me on television. <laughs> um, but we did invite Will to join us again tonight, and he is filming something in Puerto Rico, so couldn't join us, um, but wanted to send his regards. Um, and I also wanted to say, before we start talking about the projects that you've embarked on since the last time we talked to you, that uh, one of the things that Will has done in the intervening years is he had a major role in the television adaptation of Colson Whitehead's novel, Underground Railroad. Um, and we were just talking about this. Um, I watched it recently. Uh, Will is wonderful in it. This is going to be the understatement of the evening. It is not a comedy. Um, and nor should it be, right? It is a, a scathing and a searing look at um, American slavery. And the fact that Will was able to do, he plays a very central role, do so beautifully in that series as well as on The Good Place is just a testament to his acting capabilities. So um, anyway, I really recommend, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a tough show to watch in a lot of ways, but it's a really important one. In many He's ways. a good actor. He's a very good That's actor. my official statement on William <laughs> Jackson right, yes. Harper. Um, so, Mike, in the intervening years between when we saw you last and now, you've done a couple this of is my things. my little sister and mom walking. Oh, today. hello, little sister and mom. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> They're incredible divas. <laughs> they always wait until five minutes into anything, and then they make their way to the front. Good. They want well, everyone as to predicted. look at them and like, oh, I know who that is, so just... <laughs> Just let it go. It just don't okay. don't don't give them what they want, which is attention. Okay, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that hasn't happened at all. So that's so we're we're ahead of the game there. <laughs> so um, you've done a couple of major things since we saw you. One was uh, write this book, which we want to talk about, and mm -hmm. also um, you've produced an entirely different television show called Rutherford Falls, mm -hmm. which I also want to talk about. Um, but when we think about this book. I, well, I, want, I just want to give you a chance to introduce it in whatever way you'd most um, like, but I wanted to ask you to filter it through a metaphor that you use. And so I'm just going to read a quick passage. I know how much fun it is to hear people I read love it. Yeah, words please. back to you. Yeah, so let me do that. I'll do it as dramatically as possible. So Mike writes, um, think of the world as a museum and ethical rules as a volunteer museum worker standing silently in a green sport coat, hands clasped behind her back. We're all walking around the museum looking at art, in this metaphor, morally confusing situations, some of which we understand and some of which we definitely don't, because it's all swirly and abstract and confusing. And when we see something we don't know how to interpret, we can just ask the nice lady in the green sports coat what we're looking at and what it means, and she'll tell us for free. I mean, we could just nod thoughtfully and pretend to understand it, a time-honored tradition in both art, museums, and life. But there's just going to be more confusing stuff in the next room, so we might as well get some help making sense of whatever we're looking at now. So can you tell us what this book is about and in what ways it is like a volunteer in a green sports game? <laughs> so um, The Good Place was written from 2015 to 2019, roughly. and. It involved a lot of research and a lot of reading and a lot of discussing what I was reading with people who understood it. And then a lot of further discussion with funny people who um, shared in the mission of trying to make it relatable and interesting to people. And when I was done with it, I thought I felt like I wasn't quite done like wrangling it somehow. And I further thought that the ideas and concepts and philosophies that, that the world's smartest people have spent 3,000 years working through and writing down could be of great use to more people if their writing wasn't so boring. <laughs> and Guilty as charged. Right. Yeah. So if they just weren't so boring, yes. more people would engage with the material. And I had, had, this, I had been this weird bridge between the world of TV comedy writing and the world of philosophy, along with all of these other people who were uh, of enormous help in helping me wrangle and understand. So I thought, well, if I could just condense all of it into, into a, a one volume that at least gave people a, like, a, 
like a jumpstart in terms of what these people said and why it's helpful and why it's interesting and what the differences are that maybe people would enjoy uh, philosophy in a way that I had come to enjoy it, not ever having studied it and gotten a PhD at BU, like some people I could mention. So that was really the impetus was like, maybe I can just distill all this stuff into one volume that will give people the same feeling that I have, which is, hey, this stuff is really useful mm -hmm. and it's really interesting and also, no part of me wants to go to the bookstore and buy the Critique of Pure Reason and open it up on the evening when I'm like soaking in a bubble bath. <laughs> or I don't know, how do people read? I've, I forget how people read books. Um, but the, no one ever wants to do that, and I don't blame them because I didn't want to do it. And I, I only did it in part because I kind of had to to write the show. So that was the idea behind the book. Part of what I love about the the metaphor with the art museum is that sometimes when people are in art museums, they'll they'll think, well, you know, my kindergartner could do that, yeah. or you know, it's just abstract, and I don't have any way to get into it. And what that leads to is the sense that there's really no there there. It's just whatever people are you know feel like painting ends up on the walls because they're influential or something like that. And I think the the analogy to ethical theory is people think, well, people have all kinds of different opinions about what right and wrong are, and so it must just be subjective. It must just be right. a kind of relativism. I think one thing is right, you think something else is right, and there's nowhere to get any purchase on the fact that there might be better and worse ways of thinking about these things. Yeah, and, and the funny thing about this statement, my, my kid could do that in an art museum, is sometimes they're kind of right. Yeah. You know, like, I, I mean, I don't know anything about fine art. But I've had that thought. Yeah, I've right. had that, like, I'm like, this forgiven. is a red cube. Like I, I could draw a red cube. So, but I, but I think that that's that human instinct to have that feeling, and the same instinct to have about philosophy is the same. And I don't think it's entirely invalid. But I think it's good because when you read, like I, the first philosopher I really dived into was uh, dove into dived dove. Dove. Yeah. The first philosopher I dove into yeah. <laughs> was uh, was Aristotle, and Aristotle is basically like it's Goldilocks. Like it's not a difficult concept, right? It's like not too hot, not too cold, just right. Is basically that's like eighty percent of Aristotle. Okay, sixty. Sixty. Let's okay. call it sixty. Right. Okay. But the the difference between the my kid could do that version and actually understanding it, th that other forty percent is enormously important, and it. Your kid can't do that. You have to. You have to actually engage with his stuff and, and understand it. And then at that point, you get to oh well. Now I see why this is actually useful instead of like a something you could stencil on a throw pillow. So um, so yeah. But I, I but I again I think it's optimistic when people have the feeling like oh I could do that because at some level it means like I'm engaging with this art or this literature or whatever it is. I think that's a good thing that people have that feeling. If it were all impossible to access even at a basic level, then I think no one would ever want to try to access it. Right, and we, we are facing so many major moral problems in our world that if we just feel overwhelmed by it and like there's no in there, we can't sort of make head or tails of it, so we're just going to have to do whatever we feel like doing. That's can be, that can be really overwhelming and even anxiety producing. Yeah, I mean, it's all, everything's anxiety producing. Well, that's true too. I mean, we're, we're, we shouldn't get away from that even, but. But I, the, uh, to put a fine point on this, like I, I think that the, you can summarize every philosopher's main point in a paragraph, right? You can get, let's call it 40%, 50% of the way there in like a paragraph. And the, the genius and the fascinating part of it to me comes when you say like, okay, well, this is an interesting start opening gambit from this person. Like, let's actually see what that person meant. That's where the real kind of fun stuff happens because it gets into, you start like really seeing, part of it is you start to see the psychology behind, I think, why they had this mm -hmm. theory. You start thinking about what was happening in the world at the moment that mm -hmm. they had the, like utilitarianism came out of like a socialist movement in England. And it's like, well, that makes sense. Like they're, they're trying to like create a, a philosophy in which all human beings are exactly equal. That makes sense if you're part of a socialist movement in Europe in the 18th century. So. That's where the that's where to me it gets really fascinating and interesting is the not the fifty percent you can sum, summarize in a paragraph but the other fifty percent. 
Yeah, the way that um, I was taught to think about that kind of thing in at WBUR actually was mm. put it on a bumper sticker. Like, can you put Aristotle on a bumper sticker? And if you can do that, if you can just kind of lay it out in a way that gets some traction and also that you remember, then you can, you know, Roll it out for It's you. a very Hollywood way to look at <laughs> philosophy. That is the first time anyone has ever accused me of being Hollywood about anything, <laughs> but I, I appreciate that. Um, but speaking of Aristotle, thank you for that transition. I just, I had to tell you this one story about once when um, it was a kind of, in, in my teaching career, a kind of drop the mic moment. Like I sort of felt like I should have just been like that and walked off the stage because I, I had a student, we'd been in a moral philosophy class and like your book, we had gone through what are called the big three moral theories. So Kant and deontology and Mill and utilitarianism and Aristotle and virtue ethics and other things too, but those are the three. Um, and he was a graduating senior and he was, uh, also interviewing for jobs while he was in my class. And so he came to my office one day to tell me that he had been on a job interview at a big finance company somewhere, and they had asked him if there are two people that you could invite to dinner, living or dead, who would they be? And he said, Aristotle and Tom Brady. <laughs> and I thought, done, that's as good as it gets. Um, and I'm not sure if he got the job or not, but... Um, uh, speaking of Tom Brady, nope, no, no speaking of uh, Tom Brady. Okay. Brady was a strict Hegelian, so they could not have gotten along. <laughs> He's only saying this because he knows I do Hegel. So, th so but again, sticking with Aristotle, um, one of the things I really appreciated about your book um, is that it includes the most incisive, perceptive, detailed and sustained analysis that I've ever read of the question of, when you're in a supermarket parking lot, mm -hmm. should you return your shopping cart? Yes. Now, when you say it's the most incisive and detailed account of that question, it's also, I would guess, the only account. Well, no, I think Lucretius. I think, yeah, no, I think they're, they're you know, but I, I really appreciated how far you went with that. I mean, no one, if you read Mike's book, which of course you should, no one should ever expect to go to a supermarket parking lot and not experience it as a moral battlefield ever again. I, mean, really... I, I think it's the great question of our time. Yeah, I, well, <laughs> this is why I bring should it you, What are you supposed to do with your cart? Should you, do you have to return to the thing? Can you leave it in your parking space? Yes, no you one, do. No one's ever told me, and I don't know, and I, so I devoted in like 40 pages. Well, exactly, pages that's to right. To <laughs> <tell you. laughs> As I say, it's exhaustive. But, but one of the things that I, I really do appreciate about that example is so you're, when you're using it to talk about Aristotle, who has this theory that you have to start small. I mean, you have to mm -hmm. practice with the smaller things um, and build up from there. And if you don't, you can't expect to know what the right thing to do is in bigger questions mm -hmm. because you want to practice with the smaller things. So if you don't return your shopping cart, then you might not know what to do when something much bigger surfaces. And you might not even notice when a moral problem surfaces. There's a kind of, this is the sort of thing that philosophers use fancy phrases for like epistemological blockers, right? Like you won't even be able to see that there's a moral problem in front of you because you haven't practiced with the small things. Yeah, I I also just literally just want to know. Yes. Supposed to <laughs> well, that I think that's um, fair, but I did want to ask then. I'm assuming that you think that there are also bigger problems that we should build up to. Yes, of course. I mean, the the, the uh, again, the project of the book was like make this a thing that make it about the problems that I f face that start small and get bigger, and they do get bigger in the book. Mm -hmm. But also, the, the other reason for that was that like, there are, um, pro on a given day, there are like 20 to 30 of those tiny little things that we all face mm -hmm. that, are, that are infinitesimally small. And they're much more common than the, big, the gigantic. We'll face the big ones too, everybody does. But, but we're gonna, we know in the next hour after you leave here, you'll face one of the small ones. There will be some moment involving your parking space <laughs> or a, people in a crosswalk or something. And it just made sense to me to start in the, in the introductory part of the book when I'm running through the theories. It made sense to say, like, should you, like, should you return your shopping cart? Let's wrestle with that. The first chapter is literally, should I punch my friend in the face for no reason? That's the title of the chapter. Because it was like, well, let's start with things that we can all just agree on, and then we'll, we'll ramp up to like bigger things. But I think that's totally true. I think that for that idea of practicing on those small moments, at least it's like you have a certain uh, 
It's, it's, it's like a video game, right? Video games on the first level, they make it really easy so that you learn how to play the game and also so that you pay more money <laughs> to play the game. <laughs> but if the hardest level, if the first level is really hard, you're just going to be like, well, I don't forget this. I give up. And I think that as you like get a foothold into the smaller questions, the problem is that we engage with these tiny things without having any foundational Mm -hmm. understanding of why we're making the decisions. That's really the problem. Like we have gut instincts and we have things that our parents taught us or whatever, but we don't have any like structure that says like, oh, the reason I don't do this is because of this or the theory behind why it's right to do this is this. So if you have those theories, then you have some structural support mechanisms. And when you face those bigger problems, you can go like, well, this, you know, should I, you know, whatever the, should Russia invade Ukraine? Now Putin can sit around and go like, well, what happened when I was at the shopping center earlier? Did I return the card? He obviously made the wrong choice. But the, the point is yeah, definitely. that when you have those bigger points, at least you have like some, you're not, just, you're not just going on gut. You have like a theory behind what you're doing. Right, and it makes it easier if you've been practicing to confront bigger issues too. So it's also, I think part of Aristotle's point is it's just psychologically easier yeah. to, make, to deal with a bigger problem. Yeah, he also believes that like the better you get at one search for virtue the, that, that will help you and the other ones. And it's this kind of endless process of building this enormous structure, this huge pyramid that you have to live your life by. Yes. Do you, somebody need to get that? <laughs> or just... Well, they decide that. Um, so another part of the, um, the book that I really appreciated was towards the end of the book, where I think you call it something like your luck portal where you talk about, it's, it's like a four-page, 20-point account yeah. of how you got to the career point that you are at. Can you talk a little bit about that and the <clears throat> role that it plays in the book? Yeah, there's this uh, social scientist at Cornell named Robert Frank who um, wrote this whole wonderful book about luck. And his story, briefly, is that he was playing tennis with his friend and he had a massive heart attack. And uh, the ambulance dispatch was like 30 miles away, but two ambulances had happened to report to the scene of an accident like, a, like 30 seconds away from where he was, and one of them was able to break off and get to him and revive him. The actual term for what he suffered is sudden cardiac death, mm. which is the most intense sounding metal condition that you can have. And it had a 99% fatality rate, and he, his life was saved, and he woke up, and his immediate reaction was that whatever role luck had played in his life to that point, from that point on, everything was due to luck, because if those ambulances hadn't been right next to him, he would have died. And that led him to think that we greatly undervalue the role that luck plays in our lives, which I think is true. And um, like an example I give in this section is Michael Jordan, right? So. Everybody says Michael Jordan's the greatest basketball player of all time. LeBron is better, but everybody says Michael <laughs> Jordan is the greatest player of all time. And if you say, if any part of you as a sports fan says Michael Jordan didn't deserve what he accomplished, you will be yelled at. I have been yelled at many times by Bulls fans and NBA fans. And my response is like, okay, yes, he had great drive and determination and skill and talent. He worked harder than anybody else. He was more, he was more intense than anybody else. He was also 6'6", six, six, and he didn't get to be 6'6", six, because six he tried really hard to be tall. Like, that's just luck. Like, if you take Michael Jordan's exact personality and put him in the body of a five foot two inch tall goat herder in, in uh, Mongolia, then he's not, no one knows who he is. He's just a very intense goat herder <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> who screamed at all of the other goat herders for not being good enough at herding goats. <laughs> so it's okay, says Robert Frank, to say that look, so, no matter who you are, some part of what you have achieved is due to luck. Elizabeth Warren and Barack Obama made this same point. This was the great, you didn't build, I, I built that, whatever that debate was in 2012. And that what they were saying was like, you built this fantastic company, great job. All of your employees drove to work every day on streets that were paved with tax money, and they were protected by police that was paid for with tax money. They were educated in public schools that was paid for with tax money. Like, you didn't actually do this all yourself. So in the book, I run through this long list of things that went right for me at crucial moments in my life. It's starting when I, was, I started my career at SNL. I decided my then-girlfriend, now-wife, 
where are you? There she are, um, <laughs> was living in LA and was like, we got to be in the same place. And so I decided to leave and go to LA for work. And the only show that offered me a job was The Office, which everyone thought was a terrible idea <laughs> to do. You all thought it too. I know <laughs> you're pretending that you knew all along it was going to be a hit. You didn't. You thought it was going to fail. And that was the only job offer I got. And I did that job. And the guy who ran the show was my mentor and taught me everything I know. And then it became a huge hit. And then he and I developed a show together, Parks and Recreation, which then almost got canceled like 30 times. And, and it just on and on and on. And so despite the fact that I worked really hard and I think I'm a good comedy writer, if any one of those things doesn't break right for me, then my life is completely different and, and probably worse. And so I think that when you start thinking about the ways that we make policy decisions, the way that we treat other people, no matter who you are, some part of whatever you have that has gotten you to wherever you are is pure luck. It's pure random chance. And to deny that is to, I think, miss part of the point about how you ought to behave with other people, treat other people, use your money, your resources, your power, whatever you have. And that's, it's a thing that's very hard, I think, to, I don't think I had really crystallized it in my own brain until I read Frank's book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's so instructive just to think about it in those terms, too, because I think one of the, the other themes of your book is just pushing against this idea of meritocracy being the thing that we should all believe explains the world. Yeah. And those things aren't incompatible. I know there's not a person in this room who doesn't think that you're extraordinarily talented and hardworking. And so for you there to are say eight, that... There are eight, they're okay. all in the front row. <laughs> well, I'll leave that for you to figure out afterwards. Um, um, but to say that all of that can be true and it also takes some really good luck is a message that I think we get a lot of counter-programming to that. Yeah, and I don't understand it. Like, again, it, this is part of his point, too, is like it doesn't take anything away from you right. to, say, to, to say that and to believe it. Like, it, just, it, it doesn't, nothing changes, mm -hmm. it, it, but it does shift your perspective on, on your life going forward, I think, in a way that's very valuable. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it also makes you realize that there are people who are just as talented and hardworking as you are who didn't get all of those lucky breaks. And that instead of, you know, the, the classic phrase here is born on third base thought you hit a triple. Like that, the born on third base thought they hit a triple people are the worst people. It's my <laughs> least favorite. It is the, yeah, like, yes, let's applaud. Let's clap against those let's people. Let's applaud yeah. the future embarrassment and failure of those people. That's what we're applauding. <laughs> Because the, 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 uh, you don't have to name names. You can all think of them in your head. You know who they are. They're on the national stage. And they, the, it is such an infuriating mindset that you can't, like, you, part of being born on third base and thinking you hit a triple is that there's no way for anyone to point out that you were born on third base mm -hmm. and thought you had a triple because you're so deeply invested mm -hmm. in the idea that you're special and amazing and a delicate little flower who deserves everyone's love and attention. And it makes me furious. Okay. It's really like, yeah, we should get, we should change the topic because I okay. can talk All about right. nothing so, else. So, yes. Well, just adjacent to that, then. Um, if you know the name of one of these people, <laughs> go to sly.do <laughs> and use hashtag third base and just write the Let's name of the person this. in your life. <laughs> wow, that's blowing up over there. Uh, yeah, so thinking now about the title of this book that was very um, important for The Good Place also, uh, Tim Scanlon's book, What We Owe to Each Other. Um, and you've talked before in wonderful ways about how you love that that wasn't a question. It wasn't, yeah. do we owe anything to each other? But um, let's figure out what we owe to each other. And part of what you just said is that when you realize you've been born on you know, second or third base or whatever, you might realize that you owe, people, owe others, as you just said, a portion of your power or resources or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wanted, as I was reading that luck portal chapter where you detail all of these things that had to break right for you to, to be where you are, I found myself thinking um, and just thinking about extending it backwards. So all of the examples that you used were of things that have happened since you were born. And I started to think about, in my case, all of the things that had to happen before I was born for me to have the position that I have. And some of my students will know that I use this example sometimes. Um, so my family, for instance, immigrated from Scandinavia in the 1850s. 
Um, and they came literally at a time when the government was giving away 160 acres of land to white European settlers. Mm, that's nice of them. Yeah. <laughs> And they worked very hard, right? It wasn't like it was all easy from there. But at the exact same time that that was happening, there were still 4 million people enslaved in the South. And the very land that my family was being given in exchange for work had been taken away from hmm. Native Americans. So I sometimes just think about that not just as the good fortune that my family was experiencing, but experiencing at a time when it wasn't just that other people weren't being given 160 acres of land. They were being actively kept It came from kept someone. Back. Yeah, that's right. They were actively being kept back from that. Um, and so then I was thinking, you know, I wonder if Mike's ever thought about that sort of thing. And then someone clued me into the fact that you have just literally produced another television series on this question, yeah. um, which is both awesome and inspiring and a little annoying. You know, I just <laughs> felt like, you know, how did you go out there? But anyway, so this is Rutherford Falls. And I would love you just to tell us about it a little bit. So Rutherford Falls is a show I created with Ed Helms who played uh, Andy on The Office, and Sierra Teller Ornelas, um, who is a writer on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, is a Navajo. Um, the three of us created it together, and it's about Ed's character plays a born on third base, thought he hit a triple guy uh, named Nathan Rutherford, who is the scion of a Mayflower family, lives in a town called Rutherford Falls, named after his family. Um, there's a giant corporation called Rutherford Inc. that is also founded by his family. His best friend is named Regan and is played by Janice Schmeeding, who um, is a native actress who is so funny and She's great. Fantastic. She's really great. Um, and they're best friends. And he is like, a, in many ways, a sort of sensitive person who understands native issues and in other ways has enormous blind spots about his family and his history and how it conflicts with hers. And it, um, it, it was, it's on Peacock. The first season is, came out last year. The second season is being finished now. Um, but a large, it's a, a, the writing staff was half Native writers. The cast is half Native actors. And it's, a, it's about those exact issues of like of Native, the, specifically the land back movement and, and, um, and just Native people in general, their issues, their problems. Their, um, there's a reservation. It's a, it's a um, fictional town. And then there's a fictional native tribe called the Minnishanka that we invented to sort of amalgamate different portions of the native experience. It takes place, generally speaking, in a vague area of uh, upstate New York. Yeah. And so do you think of this as an extension of your book and The Good Place as well, just thinking about the kinds of questions you've gotten really interested in, but extending them backwards? Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's, you know, the ethics portion of it is deep in the background. Yeah. And what's in the foreground is is very specific contemporary issues facing native communities, which a lot, most of which obviously comes from Sierra. Um, and and the, just correcting some mis, misperceptions, I think, of native people, the, most, the things that most people think about native communities are things like they don't have to pay taxes, they do. And um, they, uh, you know, they think that all, if you, if you ask anyone, to say, like, what do you think of when you think of Native people? They will almost always name something from the Plains tribes. They'll say a teepee or a certain kind of headdress or, a, or something that they've seen in an Oliver Stone movie. Everything from Oliver Stone movies is wrong. Just don't, just, just forget all Oliver Stone iconography. And so a lot of it was just, she was like, Native people are just people. They want. They go to Red Lobster and they watch Friends and they goof around. Like it's like the, So a big a big project of this show. It wasn't so much about getting into the nitty gritty of the ethics or anything like that. It was literally just I want to make a show about my friends and 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 um, I'm speaking for her now and showing Native people as just normal people who experience joy and sadness and happiness and have friendships. Yeah, and I, but I also think that underlying everything that you just mentioned is also this sense of what do we owe to each other. So when you're someone like Nathan Rutherford and you start to understand a little better the position that your family has in this town and you start to think seriously about some of these other questions, it's a wonderful way of extending that. Yeah, there's, that was definitely, I would say, Nathan's biggest problem. Is yeah. He wasn't thinking about that question as much as he probably should have. Um, and then the second, the first season ends in a, 
in a surprise, but I won't spoil if anyone hasn't seen it, but the second season is like an entirely new set of, of issues which are on a similar line of like, mm -hmm. how, what's the, how do I function now? How, what, what's my role in this friendship, in this family and all that sort of thing? And how can I figure out, how can do I do a better job at figuring out what I literally, what I owe to people? Good, wonderful. Well, I recommend that um, the first season to everyone and when it comes out the second season. Um, as well. And, and now I think um, we promised that we would turn to some questions that some of you had posted. Um, so maybe we should. Where do they in. post them? I'm curious. Uh, well, there's this thing. Oh. Um, it is actually, there was another thing that people submitted some questions in uh, to in advance. And uh, there were many good ones. And so it was hard to choose some. It's also fascinating what some of you think a moral question is. Um, I was a little bit, <laughs> what about cats? Well, wait, read those. Um, yeah. <laughs> I will read some of those. Um, but one of the things that I, I wanted to preface this with, turning to your questions, is one of my favorite sentences from your, your book, which goes as follows. So much of philosophy involves investigating embarrassing human activities and inclinations. We really are weird little creatures. So True. weird little creatures. Let's uh, <laughs> see what some of the things that you wanted to uh, ask are. So the first pair, and then by the way, you know what to do if you have a question that occurs to you uh, while we're talking about these ones that came in earlier, um, please do. So here's the, the, the first two, and I'm gonna pair these. Um, so the first one was from someone who asked, should I stay in a profession that pays well and leads to a stable career? or go into a more meaningful field that is harder, doesn't pay as well, but will actually help people directly. And then someone else asked a question that I want to um, convince you is similar, which is, it's from someone named Chuck. How much wood should a woodchuck chuck mm. if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Well, let's start with that one, that's yeah. more important. <laughs> um, okay, the first question is a Peter Singer question. Mm. Um, so Peter Singer, a Princeton professor, a modern utilitarian, he has this movement called effective altruism where um, he's extremely hardcore, this guy, and his adherents are extremely hardcore, and they do a lot of work. There's a site called givewell.org you can go to um, where they do a lot of work saying like, okay, you have a certain amount of money you can give to charities. Like, we're gonna find the very best charities. We're gonna make your dollar go as far as it can. So the most life-saving, the most urgent uh, charities that do the best work and you get maximum value, it's, they're taking a sort of money ball approach to charitable giving. It's a, it's a very good organization. I recommend it if you're interested in, in giving money away. Um, but part of his, um, the, he tells an interesting anecdote in one of his uh, books, which is that he had this student who was like, this is my life, this is, I wanna help people, and I'm going to, when I graduate, I'm gonna uh, go to work at a nonprofit. And then what this particular student realized was, wait, that's the wrong way to think of this. The right way to think of it is, I'm gonna to go to work at the company that will pay me the most money, and I'm gonna maximize my, he's a Princeton undergrad, and so I'm gonna maximize my earning potential, and that will give me more political, or actual capital, in order to, to help more people. So, I guess the, the so he, this guy, I believe went to work at like Goldman Sachs, like the worst company, and, <laughs> with the goal of like making as much money as he could make and then having more to, to give away. So I think that the question maybe um, has a couple uh, vectors, right? One of them is like, if your only goal is to help people, you I think need to figure out like which, is, which version of helping people do you want to go after? Is it, is it making a, a money at your stable job and then taking the extra chunk of money you have and giving it to an effective charity? Or is it literally, is the work the thing that brings you the happiness and the joy and the verdant life? And so if that's the case, then there's no amount of money you can get from working at Goldman Sachs that you can then give away that will make you feel like you're on the right path. You might need to try to find a job that has a more um, kind of a deeper uh, emotional connection or something like that. Yeah, and I think for that reason, it's also an Aristotelian question. So it's a question about what would make you flourish. And I right. think some one of the criticisms that you sometimes get of that kind of utilitarianism is that there's too much emphasis on the good that you can do and not enough on what does it mean to live a flourishing life. Right. And those shouldn't be incompatible, but sometimes. No, but sometimes they are. But the, yeah. the, there's also Susan Wolf, who's a wonderful writer who wrote an article called Moral Saints, um, 
she says, she would say like the things that make your life interesting are learning how to cook French cuisine and learning how to play tennis and like watching movies that mean something to you. And that if your whole life becomes about helping people or morality or something that you're not living what could be reasonably called a, a life and that you shouldn't have that as your only goal. Yeah, I think one of the things that always strikes me as interesting about that part of the conversation is we're also, to some extent, in control of how much of that kind of thing makes us happy. And there's yeah. a lot I, uh, there's a lot of pressure to increase the things that we need to make us feel like we're happy. Yeah. And that I think is something that Aristotle is also good at talking about controlling. Like if you if you don't want your life to be turned over to pleasures that are not. Um, worthwhile, then don't cultivate habits that mean that those are the only things that will make you happy. Mm. So there's that. Um, but as far as the woodchucks, the, the thing that I appreciated about that question, the, per the way the person phrased it was, how much wood should a oh. woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? The moral encumbrance. Exactly. Mm. I knew he was going to say that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it reminds me of a part in your book where you talk about... You're actually going to answer this question? <laughs> This is what I get paid to do. <laughs> I um, thought this was a like bit. Gonna... Oh, no. Oh, no, watch me. So <laughs> so the, the point here is, um, like when you talked about um, contractarianism, so you, and you talk about how that means that we have rules that we agree on because um, we, if, if there's a rule that I want to propose, I have to imagine whether you would approve of it or not. Mm -hmm. And then you ask in the book, but shouldn't we do more than that? Mm -hmm. And so I take that question from Chuck to be more like, OK, so you're woodchuck. You're good at chucking wood. Um, but how much should you chuck? I mean, <laughs> if, it's, if it's something that you're, but maybe you're tired of it. Maybe, that's why it's connected to the original question. Because if it's something that you're good at, but maybe don't want to do so much anymore, but you might do more good at it. I don't think I'm convincing him that he should take this. Is Chuck question. here? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, moving right along. I wanted Chuck to just tell you straight up that he didn't expect you to I have a sneaking question. suspicion that Chuck is my brother, but anyway. We'll I like, I know, I like, I think you're right. I think that the answer is the, the woodchuck <laughs> should chuck as much wood as it can while still leading a verdant woodchuckish life. Nice. There. I knew we were going right? to get to that. Perfect. Maybe chuck a little extra wood yeah. so that the woodchuck next to it can take the day off. Yes, exactly. Yeah, get those muscles, those ethical muscles going as well as the mm. chucking muscles. Yeah, OK, good. Glad we've settled that. OK, next, <laughs> you'll be relieved to know here we're moving on. Um, so here's the next one. My brother is an avid recycler. And despite my efforts, I feel angry when he goes through my trash. But he's also right that I could do better. Mm. How can we find a good enough so that we're not constantly annoyed? I, OK. Uh, I would say a couple things about this. Number one, it is the um, it is just the situation with people who care about things like moral philosophy and recycling that they are going to annoy you. And I know this <laughs> because I am a person who cares about those things, and I annoy everyone around me. Is this true? We have yes. some people who so could. <laughs> I think that it is. I think it is incumbent upon the annoying people. To, um, to not burden other people as much as you can with your annoying attention to those sorts of, of uh, actions. because You have to recognize that it's annoying. You have to recognize that people don't want to be told all the time or to have it pointed out to them that they could be doing something a little different and maybe better. And then I think it's maybe incumbent upon the other people to get over it a little bit the annoyance, let the annoyance pass and go like, you know what, it is actually a better system to separate this stuff this way, so we'll do that going forward. I think it's a, this is like a real delicate give and take, I think, with where the rubber meets the road, with like someone, <laughs> this poor person's brother going into her <laughs> yeah, trash and like, like staring deep into her eyes as he like <laughs> puts aluminum for one kid, like, come on, be cool, man. Don't, don't like, wait till she's out of the room. Like, you know what I mean? So I, I, but I, this is the, like this is the this is that give and take. It's that what we owe to each other thing. Uh, some of it is just like don't like try to try not to be the person who all the time is saying like well actually there's a better way. I yeah. think that's a that's a big thing that I struggle with, and I do a lot of like biting my tongue and and digging my nails into my palm with so that I don't just make everyone in my life run away from me as fast as possible. 
Yes, and I also think, um, to argue in your favor, that there, there are a lot of things now that make me feel like those of us who feel angry when we, when we feel a little called out by other people's mm -hmm. behavior, that we really should work on that more. I think there are lots of cases in society now where it, it would be better if we felt grateful when people pointed out to us that we... But it's so that. hard, though. I know. <laughs> but one of the great things about your book is that you make it really clear that this isn't going to be easy. Yeah. Um, that this, you know, we shouldn't... I think there's this real trap on some level where we think, well, we're already good people, so anything that we do must be good. Mm -hmm. And so if someone points out to us that we're, what we're doing isn't good, then we get angry and we're surprised that it's hard to change. Yeah, and also just no one wants to think that they're screwing up yeah. ever. Like you, it doesn't, even if you don't think of yourself as like a moral arbiter, nobody want, nobody likes having it pointed out that they screwed up. So like if you're a, if you're like a scold, then, then you're just, you know that you're gonna spend your entire day with people annoyed at you. Yeah. And that, no, you shouldn't want that either. Like That's it, true. The, and, and it is not, if you if the goal here is to like make the world better in some tiny way, you're not going to achieve it that way. Like you're not going to achieve your goal because all that's going to happen is everyone's going to get annoyed at you and they won't want to listen to what you have to say. Right. Again, I speak from experience. Yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so here is another pair of uh, questions. The first one is. Is it moral to be a Dodgers fan if they have all the best players in baseball? <laughs> Uh, y yes, yes. There, I don't think it matters whether they have all the best players in baseball. I don't think that's a morality mm -hmm. question. I think there are other moral questions you can ask about your favorite team. Lord knows I do. Um, the Red Sox have a pretty troubling history. Uh, <clears throat> and the Dodgers are way better in that department, by the way. They integrated the game in 1947. So I think the the ha the the vagaries of the of the you know the TV deals that these teams sign and the amount of money they have to spend I think it's actually they're doing a very moral job because they're not just pocketing money they have a ton of money to spend and they're actually spending it on the product there are many baseball teams that have a ton of money to spend and the owners are just shoving the money in their pockets and putting a tarot. the Baltimore Orioles are a terrible franchise and they spend no money, and they have none of the best players in the game. I think it's way more immoral to run a team like that than it is to run a team like the Dodgers, who are just spend like lunatics. OK. <laughs> well, I'm going to trust you on that one. I mean, I think I agree with you that this isn't on the face of it a moral question, but I love the way you just brought out a bunch of moral questions about it. And I also think that there are some interesting questions behind it, like why is it, like what are we looking for when we, um, cheer for sports team? And what does it mean if the sport shifts from being really what is the best athletic set of people? And what is the team that has the most money to buy more players? And yeah. that, it just reminds me of something that you bring up in the book about baseball player salaries as opposed to educator salaries and all those kinds of things. Yeah, well, the problem, the real problem with fandom, there's hundreds of problems with fandom. The, the, it starts with like you identify with the team because you're a kid and your parents like the team or your friend likes the team, it's a very innocent, usually it's a very innocent thing. You live in a city, they have a team, you follow the team. And you're co-opted into this tribalism that you don't understand. And then you get older and you learn about the people who <laughs> run the game and the league. I mean, these are nightmare people. These are gangsters who, are, who own these teams. Roman Abramovich owns Chelsea. Like if you're a Chelsea, if you're a, imagine being like a six-year-old Chelsea football fan in like 2007 and being so happy because your team is so good and growing up and learning who Roman Abramovich is and knowing that he is signing the paychecks and you're giving him money every time you go to a game, that's only slightly more uh, intense than being a fan of the Dallas Cowboys or uh, any number of organizations in professional sports. And, but it's like, it's too late. You put a hat on when you were five and you're, you're a fan for life. So you're brought into this kind of intense tribalism at a very early age, and then you're at the mercy, you're emotionally mm -hmm. and morally at the mercy of a group of people who do not care about you at all and don't, don't have any, they got to own these teams because they have no moral compass, because they're yeah, billionaires. Yeah, we're talking about a sanctioned Russian oligarch here, just I'm sure. Yeah, sorry, I should have, yeah. if you don't know who Roman Abramovich yeah. is, he's a bad guy. So. Um, <laughs> So you, so then you, ha so then you, 
have to wrestle with like, is it okay for me to still root for this team? And that's to say nothing of the coaches and the players and the all of the sorts of other things that ha can happen on the team. And this is this was the hardest chapter I had to write in the book was about this issue of like, can we separate these things? Can we rip these things clean out of our souls? I don't think you can in many cases. Some cases you can, like if you're a casual fan of a musician who then turns out to be a terrible person, no, I'll never listen to that guy's music again, that's fine. But sometimes it's the Boston Red Sox for me or it's the Dallas Cowboys for somebody else and it's such a deeply ingrained part of your constitution that the idea of not being a fan of that team anymore is impossible. And then that's where, the, that's where it gets real hard. And I, I don't know that there's a simple answer. I didn't provide one. Don't buy the book thinking I'm going to provide one because I don't. But I, I do think that the, the only argument I have is that you just have to wrestle with it. You yeah. have to keep kind of like figuring out where your line is in the sand. Draw the line. Be on one side of it or the other. If you get new information, erase the line and draw it again somewhere else. But don't try to pretend. I think the problem is when people try to pretend that there isn't a problem. Right. Yes. Okay. So um, it, it must be uh, springtime in Boston because we got another question about baseball, right. um, um, which essentially has to do with how you should punish your parents if they raise you to be a Yankees fan. So <laughs> I, I think I think I'll just skip um, over that one. Okay. We've got one that to I the maximum extent allowable <laughs> okay. by law is the answer. <laughs> okay. Here comes the next one. Is it ethical to slap someone who makes a joke about your wife's medical condition? <laughs> <laughs> Huh. I've never contemplated okay. that. <laughs> when would that ever happen? Um, I, I can't imagine that I have anything to add to this debate. Um, I will say, as a person who hangs out with a lot of comedians, uh, I think um, physical violence in response to a joke is absurd and un, un allowable, I guess, in a polite society. I would also say that the problem this is like a meta answer. I think the problem in the way that it has been talked about in the last week is that it's like whose side are you on is the question. And saying whose side are you on implies that the actions were equivalent. Yeah. And um, that's not accurate mm -hmm. to me. Like a lot of things can be true at the same time. It can be true that the a physical response to a joke is outrageous and should not be allowed. It is, can also be true that that's a crappy joke and that it's cruel and unnecessary. And it's also like a 20-year-old movie that no one even remembers. That's why like the joke didn't work, because everyone was like, what is that movie again? Who is in that? <laughs> it's the worst case scenario. The joke a, doesn't was, work and, was, the, yeah. Yeah, and like just, and also it's like, uh, you know, there's, I, I, again, I'm not going to add anything to this. But I, I just don't, I think part of the problem with the Twitter debate uh, of that happens after all of these things is that, the, there's, a, there's a false equivalence in the initial approach to the discussion mm. that then everything is skewed and we can't get to any kind of good answer. So we should stop that. OK, stopping that. Um, and the next one, every day I try to be nice, but people just drive me crazy because they are so stupid. Mm. <laughs> How do I get over this? Mm. Again, I've never contemplated this before. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> that's the deal. Um, there are uh, a, a, an, an, there's an enormous percentage of the human population that that if you were looking at a pie chart, it's like half of the people, uh, and we're talking now about people with the capacity to care about ethics. Let's say so. There are plenty of people who who don't have the safety and security and, and quality of life that would allow them to even contemplate issues of ethics, right? So of the people who, who can, half of them don't care at all. A solid, call it 25 to 30%, uh, understand issues of ethics and have decided to live their lives in opposition to them. Yes. And have decided that the people that they admire and respect the most in the world are the people who have, who have not only not only don't care, but like actively flaunt it and see, see ethical rules as hindrances for dummies like me right. who care. So it's like, while I'm caring about this stuff, they're pulling their cars into the breakdown lane and zooming past me. And then there's like 20% that I think are like actively engaged with and trying to, to live by some kind of ethical code. So 
the book is for the 50% who haven't thought about it, right? The 25 to 30% who um, comprise most of the US Senate, I guess, <laughs> and, <laughs> and several high-ranking uh, business persons. Um, those people are unreachable, I think. I think it's too late, and I don't, I, the, some of them may have some kind of amazing awakening and, and realize that they should stop uh, running Tesla and buying stakes in Twitter and do something else with their money. And then 25, and then there's, then there's the person who wrote the question, right? And so I think you just have to kind of, um, it's not, don't, it's not uh, give up, right? The, that's not the answer. The answer isn't give up. The answer is just like accept that there are a lot of people who aren't um, as concerned with this as you are and that they're gonna not have, give you the response that you think you deserve and that you certainly have earned by being conscientious and trying to do right. And, um, and just keep chipping away. That's all you can really do, I think, is like it's, it's better than giving up and joining the 25 to 30%, even though it would in improve your odds of being elected to the US Senate. <laughs> what we all want. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Th those are the people that you have to worry. Read your book as a way of thinking, oh, this is what other people are worrying about. If I just skip this, I can. Yeah, I, look, the, it, the hardest thing about this, honestly, is that there are so many people who, uh, who are in that 25 to 30% who, those are the most successful people. Like, if, you're, if you were an alien and you came to Earth and someone were trying to sell you on the idea of living an ethical life and you looked around at who has power mm -hmm. in the world, you would think, like, well, that's obviously not the way to go, whatever this is. Like, I'm not going to read Aristotle. That's ridiculous, right? Um, because it's not, it's very clearly not the path that most people have taken. But also, I, you know, screw you, alien. Go back to your home planet and let us, <laughs> <laughs> let us try to figure it out. And stay because away from I, our Senate. Yeah, like I think you just have to believe that on, that so much of this is about our own integrity. That's a Bernard Williams word that he uses a lot. It's about in, your own integrity and just what makes you feel like you're doing a good job being you. And you can't, succumb to the external stuff if you're talking about integrity in your, in, in your sense of being a complete person like you should live the way you think is the right way to live and understand that it's going to rub up against other people who don't agree mm -hmm. and that's a matter of faith sometimes and sometimes you never see it yeah you do it and you don't see very it. often you don't like yeah. teaching yeah Okay, I think this is our last question. Um, so we've seen we've learned and seen a lot from each other about goodness justice and truth how have your ethics or beliefs shifted since 2020, if at all? Oh, brother. Um, I don't, I honestly don't think they shifted. They were, uh, um, I, I got just deeply bummed out a lot. I don't know if that counts, but <laughs> there was, um, I think that it's the first time, I believe in human history that we all had the same problem. Mm -hmm. That like literally every person on earth in every country suddenly, in addition to other problems that we all have, but we all had one in common. And I don't think that's ever happened before. There were whole countries who sat out World War II and didn't, because they didn't have to get involved. And no one sat this out. I mean, and, and the, um, no one was unaffected. And I did, I will confess that I had, I had this like beautiful dream <laughs> that that would lead to more systemic change than I think has occurred. The amount of systemic change that's occurred has been essentially none. And I, I really thought like maybe this will be a thing that causes some tectonic plates to shift and that we'll, we will, as a, as a country, as a, as a hemisphere, we'll begin to allocate resources differently. We'll have a better, uh, we'll, have, we'll look forward more than we look backwards, all those sorts of things. And so that did bum me out. Um, but I don't think that any of the, any of the questions of right and wrong changed. Like for me personally, it was like, it was pretty clear what we had to do. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. That was the other bummer. It was like, it was very clear what we had to do, right? It was like, don't go outside without a mask, okay? Stand six feet apart, check. Like don't, like limit your travel. If you can, if you can, if you're in a position where you can financially afford to help people, you should. That was, it was very clear. Like there was no even debate about mm -hmm. what, uh, well, <laughs> For me, there wasn't, and then, um, and then, the, then it turned out that there was a huge debate, and that was very, that was also very unpleasant. That wasn't particularly surprising. I think maybe we could have all seen that coming, 
But I, but I just remember thinking like, man, this is not only something we're all going through together, it's also a thing where the, the rules are very clear of how we should behave and to see people not behave that way was a, another bummer. It was a lot of, a lot of bummers. Yeah, it was. Um, but do you find some hope when you think about some of these philosophical theories then in the way we might think even about this range of bummers and what way we might build something um, more just and perfect? Yeah, no, I, I do. And I also think that, the, that it's easy to focus on the really awful stories. And there were a lot of lovely stories too, right? There were, we all read stories of, of neighbors helping neighbors and people rallying to, to collect food and supplies and giving masks. And even the videos early on of people applauding out their windows for nurses when they left their shifts um, in New York, like that's, that stuff makes you cry every time. Like it's, it's, there, it's, it's tempting to focus only on the dude in a don't tread on me hat screaming in a in a, a Trader Joe's because he doesn't want to wear a mask. Like that's the thing that we all I th I think we're inundated with, and that of course then the news ran with, and we all saw every one of those videos. We should also remember the really nice videos, and I think that there is something important that happened in our sense of being connected to each other, and of maybe in the future being a little more conscientious. Good. Well, let's build on that um, and close for now. So everyone, read Mike's book, watch Rutherford Falls, watch Underground Railroad, um, return your shopping carts, um, <laughs> and join me in thanking Mike uh, for this evening. And Amy's going to come up and say another word. I'm supposed to leave Thank now? you, everybody. Okay. Michael is signing books. Rarely do you get a combination of people who are smart, wise, and funny. And we have two people on this stage who are smart, wise, and funny. Um, Michael will be signing books. Uh, we have more great lineups. Go to wbr.org slash events. We've got the Man Booker Prize. Douglas Stewart, who wrote Shuggy Bane, coming on Friday night. So see what else is coming up. Thank you so much for this evening. Bye. Thank you.